I was a great pizza man. I made a lot of pizzas, and I had, you know, we were doing it all right. There was a couple little independents in my town, and they were not much threat. We were running about 70% market share, and uh, everything was good. I was living in the country club, driving any car I wanted to do, and I had a sock drawer full of money. Life's good. And the chains came in. They were about to change that because they came specifically to put me out of business. They could not survive unless they got half my sales. Right? They're just not going to make brand new customers out of 20,000 people. They're just not born every day. You've got to... See, there's only so many pizza dollars being spent in a week in a particular town. It's either in your cash register or their cash register. You just all of a sudden just have another thousand pizza people come out, pizza eaters come out of the woodwork. So uh, I was not a marketer at all. I mean, I would do a flyer because that was customary to do a flyer once in a while. I'd throw a coupon out or a little sale every four to six to eight weeks because it was customary. But I didn't, ha I didn't know what I was doing on it. I just did it. And I wasted tens of thousands of dollars with the radio station. Did you ever have a live remote at your store? You write them a check for 300 bucks, two G DJs show up. They get on the air and they're rapping about your place and nobody comes. <laughs> I did it a couple, three times because I'm a slow learner. It doesn't work. Uh, newspaper ads, quarter page, half page. They don't create momentum. They'll get a little spurt, but you barely can break even on the cost of the ad. So I wasted, 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 wasted tens and maybe $100,000 in bad advertising. Now, when the chains came to town, they know exactly what works because they have people that study return on investment for everything they do. And when they came to town, they actually had to try to pry away hundreds of my customers into their, into their fold. So do they have a lot of money to do it? Yeah, they had, they had a lot of money to do it. Were they constantly flowering every single week? Absolutely. And I'm losing customers. It's bound to happen. Some are going to go over there and they're going to stay there. So my sales kind of started doing a slow slide. It's just absolutely bound to happen. You can only cut a pie up into so many slices. They were going to get theirs. But we had, so I, I stopped and I backed up and I said, well, I'm going to have to attack these people or I'm going to have to just go out of business. It's that simple. They're going to put me out of business or I'm going to stop the bleeding and hopefully put them out of business. Because really that's, that's how it is in our business. It's them or me. My, uh, my thought was going back to diameter pizza. You all understand how pizza is, is, is made and priced? Uh, well, let me give you a drill. Let's just do a quiz. When's the last time you had a Friday night off and you never had to go into the store? Come on. Ah! It's been a while, hasn't it? Well, let's just say in your, in your dream world, you're going to have a Friday night off, and you've got a babysitter all lined up, and you're going to go do a movie and dinner with your best friends, and the phone's not going to ring. You're just going to have a great Friday night out like the real world does, okay? Instead of slamming out pies. So the babysitter arrives around, say, 6 o'clock, and the kids are there. And you say to the babysitter, here's my pager and my cell phone number. Don't call me or page me unless there's blood. And the kids, I've already threatened them with an inch of light. They're going to be great for you. They go to bed at 8, 30, 9 o'clock. Here's 20 bucks. Have some pizza to deliver tonight, so dinner is real easy for you. That, that could happen every, every once in a while in our town, right? So the babysitter, who's a, a very savvy consumer, 17 years old, she calls Pizzeria A on the phone. And what's the first words out of that babysitter's mouth? Got any, got any what? Special. Got any specials tonight? You hear that often? All the time. Pizzeria A says, we sure do. We got two 10-inch pizzas, cheese, and five items on each one delivered for 12 bucks. Cool. So she calls Pizzeria B. And what's the first words out of her mouth? Got any specials tonight? You guys are slow. You need some more coffee? Come on, man. Join me. You'll need it. Pizzeria B says, I got one 
14 inch pizza, cheese and five items, delivered for 12 bucks. Which one's she going with? A. Without a doubt. Two 10 inch pizzas, cheese and five delivered, or one 14, she's going with A, right? What's the difference between that, those two deals? Not much. Stay with me on the math. Might want to write this down. This was, this changed my life. I should have been sleep, not sleeping in ninth grade or eighth grade when they did a mathematical thing called pi r squared. Pi r round, where I come from, you know, cornbread r squared, but think about the math. For the area of a circle, we go to pi r squared. And if you don't know how to do it, I'll run you, I'll refresh your memory. On a 10 inch pizza, the radius would be this much, correct? And that's going to be 5 inches. 5 inches is a radius. Squared means times it by itself. 5 times 5 is 25. And then you times that times pi, which is 3.14. And for a 10 inch pizza, the square inches of a 10 inch pizza comes out to 78 and a half. 78 and a half square inches in a 10 inch pizza. On a 14 inch pizza, how much is the radius? Seven. And seven times seven is 49. And 49 times pi is 154 square inches. Trust me. If I were to double two 10 inch pizzas, how many square inches of pizza am I getting? Huh? 157. If I'm buying one 14 inch pizza, how many square inches of pizza am I getting? 154. Big difference to you? No. But to the customer, it's huge. Because they don't get it. It takes, three, it takes more than three 10 inch pizzas to equal 118. And does your, does your customers know that information? Not at all. Not at all. So there's only a difference of three square inches between those pizzas, but the customers will always gravitate toward the deal that's perceived as the best deal, because perception is more powerful than reality. So when you're doing couponing, you're doing sales, you're doing that kind of stuff, you're going to have to go into the perception of value rather than reality, because customers can't deal with reality. They don't have the time to think about it. Do you know how many times I explained why my $9 pizza was is good or better than their two for 10 bucks? How, how often can you do that on a Friday night, you know, when phone calls are rolling in one after the other, and they ask you and challenge you about your pricing, and you say, well, I'm 23% better, bigger, I've got this many square inches, they got that many square inches, I use 10 ounces of cheese, they use... They don't want to hear that crap. They got no time to hear that. Your people can barely answer the phone anyway. How can they go into a rap session on math to your customers? So I did the natural thing. After many sleepless nights and something I said I'd never do, I said, I'm going to downsize. In order to me to have, in order for me to fight them apples, apples, bananas, bananas, I just downsized. So as of a particular date and time, we got rid of all of our 16 inch stuff and we called this small medium and large and we were on the same page as all the chains in my town. Now I could fight them on an equal basis. Now I can come out with coupons that customers can understand without having to go through all the mathematical stuff they can't understand or a few got it, believe me, you know, a few got it and said, you know, I don't care what they charge, your pizza's junk, your pizza's great, I'm staying with you. It wasn't a money issue, but about 25% of the customers can be swayed by price. Mission statements, we had a four-word four mission statement in the big days. Four words. The way they were. Kiss ass, sell pizza. You can write that down. Now, we didn't put that on our business cards. We didn't put that on our paychecks. But every employee in that restaurant knew what our mission statement was. 
real easy. And then once in a while, when they're really doing a good job of the mission statement, I give them a chapstick. I said, man, you're doing so good. Here you go. You're going to need that. In fact, we had little chapstick things we used to hang on their aprons. I got little miniature chapsticks. I picked them up once. I got a whole box of them for like 25 bucks. So when a guy got a real, real compliment from a customer, I give him a little chapstick thing there because he... That's missing nowadays. That is missing so much. I'm down the road here at the Hampton Inn. There's none of this at all. My clicker doesn't work. You know what a response was to me? And? <laughs> Honest to God. And? I'm going, it doesn't work. So I'm leaning on a bench going CNN, Weather Channel, and that's, you know, they're paying this lady good money to represent a million dollar facility, ten million dollar facility, and she, her response to me was, and? I checked in, you know, I got all my stuff, and, and I'm coming in, and I set my stuff down, and she's busy because she's on the phone. And then about 15 seconds later, she gives me just a, a little eye contact. I check it a hundred times in a year. You got to realize this is kind of one of my things. And you know what a greeting to me was when she hung up the phone in about 20 seconds? Now, here she's sitting underneath about at least a four or five million dollar piece of property with 120 rooms. You know what a greeting was? Checking in. That's what they say. Checking in? No, I just happened to arrive with all my crap because it looked like a good place to hang. Of course I'm checking in. What, could she have done a better job? Yeah? And we're talking a million dollar, multi-million dollar operation here, right? What do your people say to your customers? Do you monitor that a lot? Do you give them chapsticks when they do a great job and reward them? I call, a lot, I return a lot of calls to a lot of pizzerias. They call, I get it on the message machine, I call back. Seven out of ten places that I call go, thanks for calling energy, can I help you please? And, or it goes like, thanks for calling Romeo's, can you hold? Yeah, well, what do you have? That's how it happens in a lot of pizzerias. That's how it happens in a lot of pizzerias. Call your, what you ought to do is exchange phone numbers right now. You slide it to somebody you don't know, have them call your place during lunch. And just write down verbatim what they say. Because that first impression is so powerful. How do you guys hire your employees? Any, anybody want to just be, be brave enough to tell me? Word of mouth. Word of mouth. Would you explain that to me a little bit? Oh, somebody knows somebody's yeah. background. Word of mouth. So let's say you need two drivers, you need two pizza makers. Uh, do you go in the newspapers with ads now looking for a pizza maker, cook, driver, and all that stuff in the newspaper? That kind of doesn't work much anymore. Because you know what we get when they walk in the door. Chronically unemployed people that aren't happy. And why in the world would they want to work for me? <laughs> and be more chronically unemployed and unhappy. You know, that's a mindset. Uh, we used to have a thing at my store. We, it was called sponsoring. If you were an employee at my store, after six months working, on, working for me, you got to sponsor a new hire. And we had very little turnaround, turnaround on, on, our, on our employees. Uh, average person stayed with me about four and a half years. Some stayed 15. A lot stayed for six or seven or eight. Some stayed for one or two. When we averaged it all out, it was about four and a half years, which is about nine times better than the industry average. Most people job hop in, our, in, in quick service restaurants about every six months. But you know how much it costs to train a person to be a good pizza maker? I did a study on it, and it cost about 800 bucks. It cost about 800 bucks. I don't know if that's high, low, but I, I said, this person, before I can actually turn them loose and make them an asset so they're a money-generating machine rather than a liability, I've got to invest about 800 bucks into it because they're going to be shadowed for the first couple of weeks by a, a regular employee, right? 
I mean, side by side, shadow, teaching them, talking to them. The next thing to do is they're new. They're going to screw up. It's human, right? So if we do all the chargeback pizzas where they didn't write the ticket right and we had to remake it twice, when you throw all those things in a great big pot and stir it up, it's about $800 average for a new hire to get them up to speed where they are producing this for our restaurant. There's three types of work that happens in your restaurant. You might want to write, write these down. They all start with W. There's a W, or there's a W, and there's a W. Three W's. Every time somebody's on your clock, and I understand you have a high minimum wage around here. Higher than average? Higher than national? What's the starting rate for you guys? Six seventy-five. For a Munster kid with no, like, like the girl at the hotel saying, and? Like you got to pay that to, for, for, for 15, 16, 17-year-olds? And then they're going to want a dollar in six months or 50 cents in six months. So seven fifty, eight fifty is not out of the question at all when you get somebody that's producing for you, right? The three W's. Anytime somebody's on your clock, they're working for you, they are doing worthy work. Worthy work comes from, got to put the H in there, sorry. Worthy work means they're creating worth for you. And you know when those times are, when you're jamming, the phones are ringing, the pizzas are going in, they're going out, the drivers are running in, running out. That is worthy because they're creating money for the company to exist. That's worthy. The second W is worthwhile. Anybody think of some worthwhile work people do for us? Yes, sir? Cleaning. Absolutely. Cleaning. That's a big one. It has to be done. And it's not fun. We're not jamming. We're not producing dollars. The register's not knocking over a lot. But it has to be done. So that's worthwhile work. What's the third type of W work? A lot of this happens. What's that one? Worthless. You got any of that every once in a while? Yeah, it's like uh, maybe 30% of the total clock time is worthless hanging around time. They're not worthy, they're not worthwhile, they're worthless. I guess, I guess our message you know, today is try to take this down to the lowest common denominator and pump it here and pump it here. And I think it's a management situation because we allow this to happen too much. When you're Going back to the employees, uh, sponsoring. Occasionally we had a, a slot open up, and the slot would be, I'd write out a little thing and put it by the time clock or by the employee bulletin board. It says, we're looking for two cooks because we have two going to college in August. So I'd like to, you know, if you know anybody that's looking for a job, give an application. And my employees would peel off applications. They would look through all their circle of friends, and they would pick one and another one and say, these folks might, might be good here. So my employees went and sold making out the app to their friends because their friends are working maybe at another job and they're not completely happy. So I very rarely would like to hire an unemployed person because they're basically unemployed by choice. Has anybody in this room ever been unemployed for more, unemployed for more than a month? Nope, never once, right? Me neither. Did anybody ever do jobs that were beneath their dignity because they wanted to be not unemployed? Yep. But it's the way it is. I'm waiting, you know, I'm biding my time working at a sub-paying job, but something's going to better be bigger and better and open up, and I'm going to jump on that. But I never really could get into Oprah. I've got to be out working, you know, and that's the kind of person I'm kind of looking for, a person that wants to switch from one job into mine because it's better. So I had all these employees, uh, maybe 23, 24 of them, and they're looking for potential higher odds, higher hirees, so they'll go give them an app, and they'll talk to them, says, Dave's going to be uh, interviewing next week, fill out the app, bring it in, drop it off. By the way, you can use me for a reference. 
These people would fill out the applications, and almost every application is the same. There's only so many questions you can ask legally, and so many you can ask, and they would sign it, and they would bring it in, and then all of a sudden I'd have eight or 10 or 15 on my desk. And I would immediately spread them all out, and I'd look for the first thing. What am I gonna look for the very first thing? Penmanship. Can I read their writing? You ever look, you ever see a scrawled out app that you said, why did you, what? give me a break. So it's just, you know, just attention to detail even on the app. I don't mind if they scratch out something and put something next to it, but it's just, I've had some slop apps coming through. They immediately go in the garbage can. Then I'm left with a, the next cut. The next cut, pretend maybe they're worthwhile hiring. But then I'll flip them all over, and on the back of all these applications is a question that says, do you have any what? What? No. Do you have any? Nope. Do you have any friends or relatives that work for Big Dave's? That's probably on every job app, right? And they'll put, they'll leave it blank or else they'll write in a name or two. And that's where I got the referrals coming from. So for instance, uh, can we pick on George and we'll pick on your name? Peter and George, Peter and George. George has been working for me for like two years. Very, very good employee. Oh, no, this guy, I love this. You know, he comes in to write, he comes in five minutes early, he leaves five minutes late, he's honest. I'd like to have a half a dozen of this guy. He knows Peter, and Peter is working at the car wash, and he's not real happy, and George talks to Peter and says, Big Dave is hiring some cooks. Here's, here's, a, here's a great time, I've been there a couple of years. He's gonna give him a little spiel. He gives you the app, so you fill out the application, you know, you fill out all the little blanks, and you bring it in to me or whatever, and I get it, and it's on my desk, and I got Peter's app on my desk. I'm working at the car wash. I'm making so many dollars an hour before that I worked here, and I went to school, and I graduated high school, and da 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 And then at the very bottom it says, I know George. George is a friend of mine. So I, I go over to George. Hey, George. Hey. I got this app right here. It's from a guy named Peter. You know Peter? I know him well. Uh, how long have you known him? If I hire... Peter, George is going to be his mentor. Voluntarily mentor this kid. At the end of 10 weeks, if he's with us, I give him a $100 bill. If for any reason Peter doesn't make it 10 weeks, and the key word there is any, George, you're going to give me a 50. You got it, Dave. Fair enough? Oh, yeah. Okay. We shake hands. We got a verbal contract. Done deal. Done deal. Is it worth $100 to get a keeper that's going to last with you more, you know, a long time? Oh, yeah. That's probably drug-free, alcohol-free, and got the right hustle? It's cheap. It's cheap. Is he going to take care of him? Oh, yeah. He's not going to allow him to fail. Because he's got pride and he's got money riding on it, right? I've had sponsors come in on their day off when we had new hires that were at risk because they just weren't getting it. Write this on your paper. ATR. This is the lowest common denominator of successful marketing. The A stands for awareness. In order to sell people anything, they have to be aware of your product or else it's a secret. The next thing is called trial, T-R-I-A-L. And the final R would be repeat. For sales to go up, those three components must be there. Two, can't, two won't work, one won't work, all three have to happen. So we have to develop plans in our town and in our marketplace so we have awareness, trial, and repeat. What if you were to start thanking your customers on a regular basis? Thank you, thank you, thank you. That can't hurt you and it can't cost very much, right? It can't hurt. How do you guys thank your customers? You got a loyal person. That person's coming in 35 to 45 times a year and he's giving you 20, 15, 30 bucks a shot Man, these people are your lifeblood, aren't they? Without them, 
See, only 500 families in your town keep you alive. If you look at your phone book and you open up your big phone book, your top 500 customers create about 75% of your gross sales. The other 5,000 names in the phone book never order or order so inconsistently it really doesn't matter. So what are you doing for your top 500 people? All righty. Okay, let's talk about the next mega trend in the pizza business. Uh, one of the neat things about my job is I get to travel all over on somebody else's dime just sucking up ideas from coast to coast to coast to coast. And when I was out in California, Oregon, in the western states a couple years ago, I discovered Papa Murphy's. And you probably all have a little curiosity on taking baked pizza, but Papa Murphy's is about 700 units strong right now. And they're opening 150 to 200 per year. They're the sixth largest pizza chain by number count and the second fastest chain right behind Papa John's. And they don't bake a pizza. No ovens. No makeup air. No Ansel system, no drivers, no sweat. They just sell lots of pizza. I am a believer of, like you are, menu contraction. I believe we should contract our menus and contract them and get rid of all the fluffy junk until we don't, until we, we have to expand it one shot. And take and bake, since we only have the saran wrap in the baking disc and these little things that stick under the baking instructions, there's no investment. Throw them a couple out there, they'll sell, they'll, sell, they'll sell themselves. What I would really look at is the items that we have not menu engineered, that we don't know what it costs to build a sub. We don't know if those subs are being built the same way every time, whether that cost goes up or down 30, 20 cents. And that's the areas that I would, you know, do the menu engineering. Then it becomes obvious which ones you've got to cut out. But yeah, but they can bake. It's so much like making pizza, it's just so much easier because you don't have to throw it in the oven. You guys... who, who sells 14-inch pizza? Raise your hand. Come on, guys. Who sells 14? Nobody. Who sells 16-inch pizza? 15s and 16s, real close. My question to you is, blurt it out as fast as you can. What's it cost you to make a 16-inch cheese, pepperoni, mushroom pizza with packaging included? First one, blurt it out. Huh? Wrong. Come on. I got two. I got three twenty-five. I got two. I got four dollars. What the? What's the real answer around here? Don't have a clue. Neither did I. So don't feel bad. I played P and L peekaboo. Remember? Oh! <laughs> and then I finally met a guy fifteen years ago who changed my life, and uh, we've got a little bit of time here. His name is Alex Zinke, and he's from the other side of the state over on Lake Michigan. He owned a big pizza place, and I was over visiting. I was buying some equipment from him. He had some used equipment, and he says, Dave, how much cheese do you put on a 16-inch pizza? How much do you put on, Charles? No oh, man. How much do you put on a 16-inch pizza? Ten. How much you put on a 16-inch pizza? Ten. Ten. How much you back there? How much you put on a 16-inch pizza? Huh? How do you do that every single time, perfectly? Pardon me. With a portion cup. How do you do it every time, perfectly? How do you do it every time, perfectly? You wing it. I wing it. Yes. So anyway, I did the same thing, you know, we just reached in there and we put it on there until she looked really good and everything was cool. And we made money. We made money. And then Alex hit me with that question, how much cheese do you put on a 16 inch pizza? And I went, 12 ounces. He said, would you mind showing me? And I said, what is this, a test? He said, yeah. So we spun out about three or four shells, we sauced them. And then I put cheese on these four pizzas right on his make line, and I had low, medium, and high. Only an ounce or two difference. Only an ounce or two difference. I think that the lowest one was like 10 ounces, the highest one was like 13, and the average, average was you know, about 12, somewhere in there. 
but I'm a heavy chaser. And he says the difference between making that one with the 10 ounces of cheese and the 13 ounces of cheese is about 40 cents. How many pies do you sell on a weekend? Mm, I don't know, 1,000. He said, that's only $400 a week. I said, well, Alex, how do you do it? He says, well, cheese is the most important product, you know, the most costliest component on the pizza, and we're allowing our 17 and 18 and 19 year old pizza makers to throw it on until it looks good and feels good. We got big hands, we got little hands, we got heavy dressers, we got cheap dressers. He says, man, you got to portion control your cheese. You got to go out and you got to buy yourself some of these plastic cups. They're indestructible, they're, they're, they'll last forever. And what you do if 10 ounces is going on your 16 inch pizza, if you're using shredded or diced, whatever, when you open up the case, it doesn't, go, it doesn't get dumped and put on the pizza line. It goes into these cups. Because most of the time, 16 inches is your highest selling pizza all the time, right? You have one size that outsells all other sizes a lot, right? 16, naturally, or 15, right? In my case, it was 14, because you know what I did? I had to downsize to play with the big boys. So let's pretend you're me, and I'm selling 14-inch pizzas and I decided that I'm going to put 10 ounces of cheese on my 14-inch pizza. Every time, never 9, never 11. I went down to the dollar store, I bought a couple hundred of these cups, and uh, the cups that I, that I used, I couldn't buy locally, so I bought these at a dollar store, but the ones I used were called 22-ounce rubber stadium cups from the dollar store. You get six or eight in a bag for a dollar. Okay, 10 ounces here, 5 ounces here. If I'm putting on eight ounces of sauce, how much sauce would I put here? Four. Cool, you guys are getting it. You're getting it, dude. If I'm putting on two ounces of pepperoni, how much I put here? One. Exactly. See how it works mathematically perfectly? Every piece is going to be the exact same density because we're using the math now instead of wild free throwing. Satisfaction is the lowest area we can deliver to ever expect customers to repeat with us. Loyal goes much further than that. Loyal means they're going to be teaching, telling all their friends how good you are. Loyal is priceless. Satisfaction is like the lowest common area of, that's the lowest number we got to jump over. If you get satisfaction and then you get loyalty, you got people that will be forgiving, buy when times are good and bad because they're loyal to you and they have a relationship with you and you use their name once in a while and do all the things right. So let's talk about you know, that loyalty thing. But as far as food server distributors go, you, we do adversarial buying. It really is a, a waste of your time. You're spending an hour trying to whip me down. And you know, you don't make your money buying food. You make your money selling more food. Anybody ever uh, seen these little dudes here? <clears throat> these are called spoodles. Half spoon, half ladle. Excellent portion control device if you don't want to go into a digital scale, because I really recommend that you go into a digital scale on your make line and make every pizza right to the number, just like the real boys do. But in lieu of that, if you dip this in your green peppers and level it off, you're going to be very, very, very close every single time, and you, you dump that and you sprinkle that on. So if we know we're going to be doing 10-inch and 14-inch pizza, I might do one dip, two dip. See how I did it? One dip, two dip. So spoodles are really cool for portion controlling. They're better than nothing. They're better than just reaching in and free throwing. First of all, I'm going to create awareness, trial, and repeat. And I don't care what it's going to cost for me to create awareness, trial, and repeat. It's going to be like a free night like we did with the bakery. First hundred people on Thursday night in line get a free 12-inch pizza on the house. I'm going to create a buzz and a word of mouth. The next thing I'm doing is I'm going to make a better pizza than you are. I'm going to dry try. and it'll be the same pizza every single time. So that's going to put the people that make the garbage pizza in your town at risk of me coming in and rocking and stomping. My stepdad told me when I was 23 years old and I just invested in my second pizzeria, he gave me these Mark Twain words of advice. You ever get advice from your parents when you're too young to realize the value of it and then all of a sudden the light goes on 10 years later? <laughs> he said, uh, Dave, uh, you're making great pizza. I don't think I've ever eaten any better. Always make great pizza. He says, in your town, always make the highest quality pizza there is. 
the very best that you can money can buy or make the cheapest pizza in your town make the highest quality or make the cheapest never be in the middle because if you're in the middle this guy's coming down he's going to be yanking your customers out and this guy's going to come he's going to yank your customers down and the guys in the middle are the guys that fail I said thanks dad and it never dawned on me to remember that whenever you make these decisions on should I use the next best should I use the next best the next thing is I didn't know all products when I, I only knew what I knew you only know what you know you know that's why we kind of do these things but I started being a student of the industry and realized that guy's Italian sausage is a lot better than mine so I went dumpster diving and found out why you know no this is really you never you never did that did you <laughs> invoice peaking I don't care what you call it but you know I'm always looking to improve my product and make it better better and then I, I you know and I, and I constantly do but if you're here you're at the middle so getting back to your question I would make the kick butt pizza in town I'd hire the friendliest people I'd have the cleanest store sparkling bathrooms wash delivery cars drivers that look like drivers and I automatically half the people in your town are at risk because I'm gonna romp and stop over somebody because I know they're not clean they're not fast they're not groomed they're making schlocky pizza happen you know it's average you know so I'm gonna immediately not only have to deal with the top two or three or four producers the next thing I might do is do the ultimate pizza guarantee wanna find that in big days with big buck the ultimate pizza guarantee Let's hear it. What page is that on? Say again. Turn to page 17. Big Dave's Ultimate Pizza Guarantee. Go ahead and give it a quick read. Everything. Everything that left my store had the ultimate guarantee on it. Because we wanted to be perceived as what? The best pizza in Oscoda. And we put our money where our mouth is. We not only guaranteed our pizza, which is only, you have to, we guaranteed any pizza in my town. I got a bad pizza from anybody in your town, you call me on my private line, it's replaced free. One time. Who doesn't like a guarantee? If there's any questions that pop up that were not clear, uh, you know, it's no charge. These, these people brought me here, and I know if, if I... You know, if, I, you know, if I, I didn't answer something, let me know. It's just been a real pleasure to be here. I really have loved every minute of it. This is what I do. This is what I love to do. And I just want to say thank you to your family, Joe, Paul, Derek, and everybody. I appreciate it. Okay. I think the Colony food would rather have you be profitable for the next 10 years and sell you an extra 20% of cheese and have you go out of business at risk and be at risk. Am I, am I, am I true in that, Michael and Joe? No question about it.